All right, so I was completely muted there for a moment. <laughs> um, let me go back if I can. All right, I'm Juanita Papineau, and I'm the commercial fruit production extension agent for Orange Lake in Marion County, and I'm going to talk to you today about homeowner citrus. And sorry about those issues with the uh, um, muting. <laughs> okay, a little bit of history. <clears throat> um, citrus is a, an icon for Florida, and we still produce a lot of citrus, but Lake County probably not so much as it used to. Lake County used to have more than 140,000 acres in citrus. Now it's down to about 8,000, and that is continuing to be reduced uh, for a number of reasons. Um, you can see here based on our, this is the production history for the whole state, but you can see gradually production built up until the 80s, and that's when we had a series of freezes every few years, and you can see the production went right down to uh, a low level, but then gradually began to build up. And that's really a lot of the citrus industry moved further south, south of Lake County, down into Polk County and further south. And uh, Lake County then, because we're kind of close to Orlando, um, we've had a lot of other issues. But the, the most recent decrease in production has been from citrus greening, which I will talk about a little bit later disastrous reduction in production, but we are starting to get a handle on how we can continue to get trees to produce with greening. This was also Hurricane Irma, but we're getting a little better handle on how to produce with greening, and so production is starting to go up a little bit um, in 2019. Okay, well, so the challenges in Florida are that we have competition from abroad. A lot of the uh, juice processing plants that are still in business are actually getting their juice from Brazil and Mexico and not necessarily from Florida. So they can ship that juice in cheaper and produce uh, whatever, whether it's frozen concentrate or um, uh, juice in the, in the jugs straight out. Uh, this, and recently there's been a reduced demand for orange juice until COVID-19 which has caused a lot more people to be interested in drinking a healthy drink like orange juice. We also had rapid urbanization, loss of acreage, especially in the Lake County, Orange County area where we have Disney World. A lot of our um, citrus groves have been sold for housing and other things. Uh, we do have a problem with labor shortages, guest worker program, immigration reforms. So we've had some issues trying to get people to pick fruit. The new nursery regulations, because of the diseases we've had, they've had to put much more strict regulations on the nurseries. And so the number of nurseries went down dramatically with citrus canker, and that's reduced the availability of trees. And then bacterial diseases, which Huang Long Bang, HLB, or greening and canker were the two bacterial diseases we've had in the last um, 10 years or so that have caused all these new nursery regulations and a real decline in tree health and production. Okay, I'm going to be going through a lot of um, information for you, but I want you to know that there are several University of Florida publications, Citrus Culture in the Home Landscape, and that, that website um, link, uh, it, you don't have to necessarily type that in. If you type in Citrus Culture and IFAS, I-F-A-S, that's the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, you will get these links for citrus culture in the home landscape, citrus problems in the home landscape. Um, there is actually a citrus diseases key that you can get as an app on your mobile phone, your smartphone, which is very helpful to help you um, key, down, key out what the problem is. And then the University of Florida produces a production guide for commercial production, which is that final link there. Um, the Citrus Research and Education Center, crec.ifis.ufl.edu, you can get the production guide. Okay, I'm, hopefully everybody's written that down if that's what they're going to do. But as I said, you can just type in citrus and IFAS and it will get you these links. Okay, so to start from the beginning with a citrus. Um, how to plant a tree. Well, first you want to make sure you're buying certified 
stock from the nursery. And that, that tag across the top there is what all the certified nurseries have to provide on the tree. And it tells you the cyan, the top of the plant, and then the rootstock, which is in this case, swingle. You need to see that to make sure that it's a certified tree so that it was disease free in the nursery and hopefully will be when you plant it out. You should inspect that tree for diseases and insects because sometimes those trees come out of the nursery clean and they sit around in a, in a lot to be sold for a while and they can get things. So check to make sure there's no leaf spots or insects on it. Um, if you're getting the tree in a container, which is usually the way you can buy these, a lot of fruit trees are planted bare root, citrus, uh, unless you're a commercial grower getting large quantities, you're probably going to be getting it out of the container. You can plant that any time of the year. I like to wash the soil from the roots and inspect the roots for problems before I plant it. You don't necessarily have to go that far, but you should try to check the roots as much as you can. And if you have roots that are circling around in the pot, you certainly want to make sure that you cut those, spread them out when, you, when you're planting the, the tree, or sometimes you can just slice down. There's different techniques for planting any kind of a tree. Some of them shave off the outer half inch on all this, on a, you know, the sides and bottom, or they will cut down through in, uh, in quarters. Um, any way you can to, to break up those roots so that you don't have them circling that would cause eventual girdling of the tree. So spread out the roots in the hole. Make sure you're not planting too deeply because you want that top root right at the soil line. Citrus trees really don't like to be planted too deeply or be too wet, and they will just collapse on you if you do. Okay, so irrigation, when you first plant it, you wanna make sure that you're planting it so that you have a little base in there that can hold about 10, uh, five to 10 gallons. And then every week, um, for the first month or so, you're gonna put in, fill that basin two times a week. As it gets older, you can start to cut back some on that water, but you do wanna make sure you're watching for wilt on young growth in the afternoon. And if you're putting in water and it's standing there and not infiltrating down in, you're gonna be causing more of a problem. So hopefully that water, when you're putting it in that basin, is not standing there for too long, but actually goes down through. Because citrus trees do not like wet feet at all, and they will get diseases very quickly with that. Okay, so everybody wants to fertilize as soon as possible. Well, really you should wait to about three weeks after planting. The roots will start to be moving then, and that's when you can start to plant. Now we recommend an eight to eight ratio. Uh, that's nitrogen, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, plus minors. And the micronutrients are very critical, especially with the disease issues we've had. So minors are very important. So make sure you get fertilizer that has the minor elements, especially manganese, zinc, iron, boron, like that. I'll talk about those a little bit later on. A controlled release fertilizer is the best. It's the easiest. If you can get a nice controlled release that has that nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium all controlled release, that means they slowly release. You can get ones that will, that will last for a year or six months or three months. Um, if you put that down, you can do it much. Um, you don't have to put it down as often. Now the publication that I have this table from indicates 666-888-101010, which are very common fertilizers that you should get. We really prefer an 828. You don't need as much phosphorus and our soils naturally have a lot of phosphorus. So if you can get an 828, uh, that's even better. But if you only can get an 888 or a 101010, these are the amounts that you're going to be putting on. And again, this is table is taken from the, um, of publications that I listed before. So you can find those pretty quickly. Okay, Carol Ann, if you have a question, type it in the, in the, in the um, chat box and Wanda will um, get it to me. Okay, for mature trees, there's a, again, that ratio of eight to eight if you can. And for this is for trees that are five years and older. And you can expect that a citrus tree, when it's first planted for the first five years, it may produce some big puffy kind of fruit. They're not very high quality until they get to be about five years. And that's when they really start to settle down and produce fruit. 
However, during those first five years, it's really critical not to let diseases and insects affect them if you can help it, uh, because that will, can stunt the tree for the rest of its life. So for first- Juanita, we have a question. Yes. Someone says they have a um, citrus tree, a mango tree, and a persimmon tree. Is there one fertilizer that they could use for all of them? Yes, a, a controlled release fertilizer that's like that 828 with, with minor elements as well, good for all of those. Okay, and then someone else says, is that frequency for C CRF? The control release fertilizer, when you buy that, it will tell you how long it will last. And you can get ones that will last a year and you can get ones that will last three months. So you just have to read what it says. Um, in this, um, on this slide, I tell you about the amount to put on, on for mature trees. You measure the circumference around the tree and you apply about a pound per inch of circumference. Um, and although the, the uh, table there says split between two to four applications, the more applications you can make, the, the, you know, a small amount frequently, the better for the tree. Because with the issues with citrus greening right now, the roots are really constrained and, and damaged. And if you can apply small amounts of fertilizer and water frequently, it's much better for the tree. Um, so if you're, um, you're going to be fertilizing March through October, uh, and you can put that controlled release fertilizer on, and, and depending on um, how, uh, how often it says you're supposed to put it on. So any, any kind of um, length of time, they, they formulate them different ways. The, the controlled release formulas, it's, a, um, it's kind of like a, a thin plastic film around the fertilizer with little pores in it that will gradually release the fertilizer and that's how that works. Okay, so citrus problems, because you're sure to have something going on. I'm, um, most people do, um, and hopefully it's not gonna be serious. Below ground problems are the ones that are very hard to see and the tree just kind of declines. It's hard to tell for sure what it actually was, but that's the ones that, that can kill a tree. Most of the other problems, leaf spots, things like that, are not that serious. They won't kill the tree. Often they don't affect the fruit quality inside. They may look, make the fruit look ugly, but it still tastes good. Um, so, and, and a lot of people just automatically respond with pesticide applications. And pesticide applications probably do more harm than good because they will kill the beneficial insects that you have there, and as well as the bad guys. So um, I try to, reduce my pesticide application as much as possible or target it. So low ground issues, um, foot rot or root rot. And um, this bottom, bottom left hand picture is um, Phytophthora on the base of a trunk. You can see the, the trunk's just all kind of rotten out. This is one of the reasons why we say don't have any mulch up close to the trunk of a tree. Citrus especially, they do not like having mulch on them. Um, try not to have the irrigation going onto the trunk, but right at the root zone. Don't, don't put on too much water because they just cannot take too much water. And then there are, there are issues with nematodes. The little tree on the right hand side there, uh, the leaves all just turned yellow and fell off. And this tree was actually, uh, one of the problems was the rootstock. If you can get it on swingle rootstock, which is a much more resistant to Phytophthora, you won't have these issues. This was on a, a susceptible rootstock and it had some issues with um, the uh, root weevils that chew on the roots and then the disease sets in and it caused that whole tree to collapse. So hopefully you won't have those issues if you're very careful about watering and in the, the site you've planted. Okay, above ground, we can have problems with insects, mites, diseases, whether they're fungal, bacterial, or viral. And then there's nutritional or disorders that can look a lot like these other things. So we're going to go through them and, and talk about them. Juanita, someone says, can they replant a small tree from the ground into a pot? Digging up a tree from the ground and putting it into a pot? Certainly, you can do that. I would make sure that uh, when, you, when you put a plant into a pot, you don't want to use the same soil that's in your ground. You should use a potting mix because when you put a plant into a pot, 
it changes the way the soil drains completely from the way it would be in the ground. And so as long as, long as you're putting it in a potting mix into a pot, there should be, not, should be no problem. Um, pots require more water and everything, but that's because they're better drained because of that, that um, type of media you're using. All right, getting back to southern, southern green stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs. These, um, you've probably seen them outside before because they can affect all kinds of things in your garden and cause problems. Um, the damage to the fruit is by piercing sucking mouth parts that they have. And on a citrus, when the peel is damaged, you'll get this discolored area and, and then the flesh below will be damaged and rot sets in. So I have some photographs here. These are some navel oranges and you can see these are on the, the sides of the fruit and those little holes in the middle of this brown spot. And that's where that leaf foot bug or stink bug had pierced it and sucked out some of the juice and then flew off and then all kinds of rot sets in. And, and the fruit will may hang on the tree for a while or it may fall off. Fruit that's falling from a rotten stem end um, is not quite the same as this. This is the, the, the damage was on the side of the fruit. Citrus rust mites, this is a very common problem that people bring in. These rust mites are microscopic and you can see there in the upper right hand side, um, there are these little cone shaped things. You have to use a, a, a hand lens with like 30x um, magnification to be able to see these. But you will see their damage, which is this blackening rust um, and if, it, if they attack the fruit when it's very small, you'll get what they call shark skin on this bottom picture because it, they, they rupture and, and scar the little cells and then as the cells expand, as the fruit gets bigger, it, it's all rough like that. So they cause this smooth, dark brown surface blemish on the fruit on the sun exposed side. And um, shark skin, as I said, if there's early feeding damage. Now, what can you do about this? Um, rust mites and other mites, well, I'll talk about the other mites, they, can, they usually cause a stippling or small whitish yellow spots on the leaves and not, not really on the fruit so much. And you may find webbing, fine webbing because of uh, spider mites. Um, they like to hide underneath the leaves and feed there. Dry periods are when they're worst and oils can be used to control them. Insecticides may not work because mites are a uh, um, they're more in the, in the spider family, not an insect family. And most insecticides will only work on insects. They don't actually work on, um, on spiders. Um, so you'll need to either get a miticide or use an oil. Homeowners can usually get oils, uh, horticultural oils that can help with this. But you got to remember that with that, um, going back to those rust mites, the fruit doesn't look so pretty, but inside the fruit's just fine. So you really don't have to worry about it. Okay, orange dog is another very common pest on citrus. It is actually the swallowtail butterfly, but the larvae look like bird droppings. Um, the caterpillar looks like a bird dropping, and it's about one to two inches in length, and it will eat your leaves off. And a lot of people, you know, well, I don't really want to hurt my, you know, I want, I want the swallowtail butterfly, but if you've got a small citrus tree, you probably should pick them off and um, not let them eat all your leaves off. Larger trees, you can let them support some swallowtail butterflies. The leaf miner is another really common problem that people bring into the clinic all the time. The leaf miner, the adult, is actually about a quarter inch um, long moth and it lays its eggs on, the, on young foliage, and then the larvae are translucent and greenish. And you can see the egg, the larvae then tunnels between the layers of the leaf. So it's actually between the leaves. And that, that lower right-hand side photograph, right there in the top of it, you can see there's a little kind of translucent green larvae that's in the middle of that tunnel that it's eating through that leaf. And the tunnels will smart up, start out really small and they get bigger and bigger and bigger as that caterpillar gets, or the larvae gets larger. And um, this causes the, the leaves to be curl up and, and be all distorted um, and just look really weird. Um, it can cause leaf drop, possible stem dieback. It's best not to have them, but they're so common. You'll see these things on your, on your tomatoes and everything else. There are some beneficial insects out there that will help to control these, and that's why if you can help it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spray for them. 
Um, besides, they are in between the layers of the leaf and most of the sprays that are safe to use um, won't contact them because they are protected there. They're shielded by that leaf. You would have to use some kind of systemic. And um, nobody wants to have a systemic insecticide that may get into their fruit. So hopefully you're, uh, you can pick these off when you see them if they're very bad or um, leave them there for the beneficials to, to find. Aphids are another bad insect. If you have any kind of garden, you know what aphids are like. They infest the new flush of growth. They suck the sap from the growing leaves and stems. They can damage young trees if there aren't that many leaves on that tree to begin with. They produce a lot of sooty mold, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, biological controls, we have lady beetles, hoverflies, lace wings. These will all eat these aphids. Usually not, they usually can't keep up with that population very well. Um, but it's a, a, with summer temperatures and lack of new growth flushes, they'll, the populations will decline. One problem is that they can transmit um, the Tristeza virus and other viruses in any of your plants. Sooty mold, which I just mentioned, is uh, people will bring these plants into the clinic, they cover with sooty mold, they think it's a fungus that's killing their plant. It is a dense black fungus, but it's growing on the honeydew, which is secreted by the insects like aphid scales, soft scales, white flies, and mealybugs. And you can see on the leaves here that, that the, the underside of that leaf is covered with some kind of insect. They're all like excreting honeydew, and then the, the sooty mold's growing on that. The problem is not the sooty mold, the problem is with the insect. And that's what you need to target your controls on. The sooty mold, once the source is taken away, that sooty mold will dry up and, and, and flake off. It's, um, it's not growing in the leaf, it's just on the surface there with the, with the honeydew. Okay, so now real diseases on citrus. Citrus scab is a nasty looking one. Um, the lesions will change from pink to light tan. You'll get these warty growths on the leaves and, uh, and on the fruit. Um, it only affects tangerines and grapefruit. So if you haven't seen it before in your citrus, that's because you're not growing tangerines and grapefruit. Um, the inside of the fruit, it, it, you know, when you cut that fruit open, it's still fine inside. It's only the outside that looks ugly. If you see cases on, you know, the, the leaves are, are warty like that, you can remove them. Um, if you want to use chemicals, um, timing is key. You have to put that first application on when you have a quarter expanded flush. Separate, separate application at petal fall, and the third application three weeks post second application. And copper is the best homeowner product. Copper is used widely for all kinds of diseases in citrus. And I just want to warn you that copper can build up in the environment. And so if you're going to use copper, just be um, judicious about using it. Melanose, another very common problem. You'll see these kind of streaks or spots. Um, the real diagnostic for this one is that it feels like sandpaper. If you rub your hand over the leaf spots or the, the um, spots on the fruit, it feels like sandpaper. It is really, um, it affects all citrus types, especially grapefruit. The spores are going to be in those dead twigs uh, that are pencil diameter or less, and you can cut those out. The fruit can be affected from fruit set to two and a half to three inches, and then it doesn't really affect the fruit after that. The fruit damage is superficial. It, it, inside quality is just fine. Um, but, uh, and copper applications can be applied if done every three weeks from late April to mid-June. But if it's not hurting your, your, your fruit quality, you're probably okay. Now greasy spot, kind of similar, but this one is not, you won't feel that sandpaper. You'll see this kind of a yellowish model with the reddish brown blisters. Looks like drops of grease. As the lesions age, it will affect all citrus, especially grapefruit, pineapple, pineapple is a cultivar, hamlins, and tangelos. And for this one, the symptoms appear about six to nine months after infection. The spores are formed in that leaf litter under the tree. So if you can get the leaf litter out of there, that's good. Fruit, once again, are only affected when they're very, when they're small, two and a half to three inches. Again, superficial fruit damage, it's not gonna hurt the inside of that fruit but it can reduce tree vigor because of those leaf spots and, and leaf dropping from that. So two copper or horticultural oil applications in late May to mid June are usually sufficient. And grapefruit are very sensitive to this, so they will need those two, two applications instead of just one. 
Alternaria brown spot, these are, are fruit lesions that are protruding or sunken, it could be crater-like. Leaf lesions are, are smooth with a chlorotic halo that follow the veins on the leaves, and it can affect various tangerines and tangelos. Now, tangerines are not very common anymore because citrus greening has killed most of those off. We can talk about that a little bit later, but only tangerine tangelos infected. Spores again in the leaf litter and twigs, you can remove those and destroy them. This, this will cause leaf and fruit drop. Fungicide sprays from early April to mid-June, at least every three weeks. Again, copper is going to be your best op um, option. But again, it's only on tangerines, and not many people are growing tangerines anymore because citrus graining has killed those before. Alternaria can cause a problem. Now, citrus canker, many of you may remember, citrus canker was a disease that came in and they were trying to isolate it and eradicate it. If they found any trees that had this, they would cut, cut down that tree and any tree within, a, any citrus tree within a quarter mile of that tree. And it caused all kinds of problems. And then we had hurricanes that spread it everywhere and cutting down trees, there was no way to eradicate, no way to control it or to keep it in one spot. It was now all through the state. So citrus canker though, is, it is a bacterial disease, but it's not nearly as bad as the other bacterial disease I'll be talking about next. Citrus canker causes necrotic lesions on the fruit, leaves, and twigs. Um, grapefruit, navel oranges, some early oranges are highly susceptible. Pruning is not effective. Um, mainly, it is mainly cosmetic, but it can cause defoliation, shoot dieback, and fruit drop. And um, really the best thing is sanitation, decontamination, getting these affected um, leaves out of there. Uh, copper can be used to prevent it, but once you get these lesions on your trees, there's, uh, you, can, you can apply copper a lot to try to keep it from spreading, but it is there. The bacterial uh, infection is on the leaves or in the twigs. The best thing to do is try to cut it out or get it out of there, although pruning is not truly effective because um, you can't keep up with everything that's there. So hopefully your, your plants are not too affected by this, but if you see this on your fruit or on your leaves, you can get, remove them as soon as you see it, and hopefully you can control the spread that way. Okay, citrus greening is the big, the big problem that um, has really significantly impacted citrus production in Florida. Citrus greening, you'll see yellowing shoots, you'll see twig dieback, stunting, off-season bloom, and then the tree just really declines. It's um, bacterial disease, first noticed about 2005. Now it is throughout the state. Uh, it got throughout the state because at first people thought it was just a nutrient deficiency. and Didn't realize it was a disease until it, it was too late because this can infect a tree and then it can take three to five years before you really see it impacting the tree and causing the tree to decline. It is spread, it's a bacterial disease, it is spread only by this Asian citrus psyllid. You can see in the um, right hand side there how big that psyllid is compared to your fingertip. Um, this bacteria gets inside the plant. It's not like citrus canker was a bacteria on the outside causing problems, but it doesn't move throughout the, tr the plant. This bacterial disease goes throughout the vascular system of the plant and then clogs it up and there's really no treatment available. This is a citrus psyllid. Um, they fly, they're carried by the wind to new plants. They will feed on an infected tree and then they'll transmit the bacteria to healthy trees because it's a piercing sucking like a mosquito transmitting malaria. You can see the, the, the larval form there um, in the upper left side, then um, the adults there on the lower left side and the eggs on the right hand side. And I will show you um, sometimes you, the, the nymphs there will produce this waxy secretion, looks almost like a mealy bug secretion, but you'll see this notching on the leaves. And by notching, it's, it's a little deformation of the leaf where the, the leaf kind of curls in on, on, the, on either side. Um, so it's called notching, but it's more of a leaf deformation than an actual bite, bite out notch. And that's in evidence you have Asian citrus psyllids. Now they don't necessarily have the greening, because they'll only pick up greening if they feed on an infected tree and then transmit it. So if you've got greening, you will see these blotchy model patterns on the leaves. The mature leaves, you'll have this asymmetrical um, 
pattern inside or, or outer edges of the canopy first. Pattern appears on both sides of the leaf. And I will show you this next slide to show how to tell the difference between nutrient deficiency, which is what they first thought it was, and actual greening. So when you take a leaf and you draw a circle on either side of that mid vein, and you look at, compare those on a citrus greening affected tree, they are not the same. It's kind of random modeling. Whereas on a nutrient deficient leaf, which is this bottom picture, you see that they look pretty much the same on both sides. That means it's not greening, that's a nutrient deficiency. So some other leaf symptoms with greening, you'll get yellow veins. So you can see in the top picture there, kind of a yellow vein not a definite symptom of, of um, huang lung being or greening, but you should inspect the tree more closely if you see it. And then you'll see vein corking where the veins become kind of raised and corky, and that's on mature leaves with citrus greening. And I have to tell you that pretty much every mature tree in Florida probably has this. Some trees tolerate it more than others, and I will talk to you at the end about some cultivars that you can plant that are tolerant to this. Now to look at nutrient deficiencies, because they're easily confused, and these are often seen on citrus trees, most of these micronutrients, which I'm gonna be talking about, are caused by a high soil pH. So if your soil pH is getting above seven, you, and, and especially up to about eight, you will see these deficiencies. And that means you should do something to correct your soil pH to lower it, to make it more acid and also to provide some micronutrients to your trees. So zinc, you'll see small, narrow leaves with intervenal chlorosis. With iron, you'll see the leaves are light yellow to white in color with the veins still green as well. Manganese, you'll see dark green veins with a lighter green background. And magnesium, you'll see this inverted V pattern where the, the, the center is kind of dark green and then the outer parts are, are pale colored. So those are um, some of the nutrient deficiencies that are very common and were easily confused with greening at first. But you can make up for these with micronutrient applications. Okay, with greening, you can also get external fruit symptoms. A lot of people are like, oh, my, my fruit, it's, it's called citrus greening because the fruit doesn't turn the color it should, it stays green. It can be lopsided, misshapen, and small, like this is shown here. Um, often you'll find uh, this uh, yellow stain beneath the calyx button, which is where the, the stem attaches to the fruit. That's where rot will often set in with citrus greening. And you'll see um, on, on uh, these cut, cut through fruit, you can see this kind of rotten area there on the stem end. And that often causes fruit drop. And I can tell you that I rarely ever see this misshapen fruit because usually greening affected fruit that's that badly affected rots and, and falls off before it ever turns bright or close to ripe. The tree symptoms, you'll see that leaf and fruit drop. You'll see yellow branches. Severely infected trees will be stunted with sparse, full, sparse leaves, twig dieback, off season bloom, and it will eventually kill the tree if that tree doesn't receive some, some tender loving care, as I'd like to say. Um, they have found after trying all kinds of different things that it's the, really the, the roots are what's important. The, the disease kills off the roots because they're not getting the photosynthates from the leaves coming down to them. And so it's important to, to baby those roots along. Um, they were trying foliar applied um, nutrient cocktails for a while, they really did not work. Some people talk about soil applied biostimulants, maybe. Right now we found that using higher levels of manganese and zinc applied to the soil have actually helped those trees to continue. And it's three times what our normal recommendation is. And you have to be careful with any kind of micronutrient or minor element that you don't put on too much because they're called micros and minors for a reason. The tree doesn't need a whole lot normally. And too much can cause a, a toxicity. But we found that with this greening infected trees, they can use more manganese and zinc and iron than what we used to recommend. And as I said, we want to spoon feed those roots, either using a controlled release fertilizer, uh, make sure you have micronutrients, 
You want to make sure that you're applying, you, you can, uh, some growers will use a fertigation where they actually put the fertilizer through the, with the water. Small amounts at a time, you don't ever want to over fertilizer, small amounts at a time and more frequently, or using a controlled release, which essentially does that, small amounts are, are, are released from that um, pellet gradually. Some of the other research most recently has shown that oak leaves seem to have something that helps the trees to survive. And they're, they're doing research on it right now, but they actually make a compost tea with the oak leaves. And they've sprayed that on the trees. They've also, um, you know, using it on the soil, it seems to help trees overcome greening or continue to grow and tolerate greening. Um, and, and in some cases may even reduce the bacterial titer in that tree. But they're doing some work on that. And that's something that I'm telling homeowners you can do. We've got plenty of oak leaves around here. You can try making a compost tea, or if you don't want to fuss with all of that, you can just use oak leaves as, um, as a mulch around the, the, the roots of the citrus tree. Just make sure it's not up too close to the trunk because that's where um, it can hold in moisture and cause that, that foot rot. Okay, another thing that you can do for greening is Tamarixia is this tiny little wasp and you can see it's very small little wasp. People are always worried, I don't wanna release wasps. Well, this one's not gonna hurt you. It's a tiny little thing and it actually lays its egg in the larvae or the, the nymphs of the um, Asian citrus psyllid. And these ones down here that have the holes in them, that's because the larvae of the, of the wasp has, has developed and eaten up the insides of this tamarixia, of, of this um, psyllid, and emerged as an adult. It cuts it, it chews a mouth, uh, chews open a hole and emerges as the adult and um, kills the um, Asian citrus psyllid in that way. If you would like to get some of these, periodically our office uh, hands out tubes of them because they're so small you can get a, a little vial and it has like a hundred in it. Um, but the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, that's FDAX, FDACS, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, can supply these. The, you can go online and uh, Google Tamarixia and FDAX and you'll find this release application so that you can have um, some sent to you to re be released. And these will just they will never completely control the psyllids, but they will help to control them. Okay, now, so everybody wants to know, what can I plant then that, that's not gonna get it? Well, sugar bell is a mandarin type that has been around for a while, and I have a picture of it right there. It looks kind of a bell-shaped, um, very nice flavor. That one is pretty tolerant. That's been around for a while, so it's, it's relatively easy to find. Tango um, has also been around for a while. It's a mandarin type or mandarin hybrid. It, is, it has been around for a while. You should be able to get it. Bingo is one that's been developed more recently. It may be more difficult to find. Sun Dragon is one that the USDA recently developed and it, it's very new. It may be more difficult to find, but uh, with time you should be able to find more. It doesn't look very pretty. It, it's because it's got a really complex um, genetic background to get that um, disease resistance in it. But the, the flavor of this is wonderful. So if you get a chance to get some sun dragon or taste sun dragon, um, try it out um, because it's it very, very tolerant. None of these are completely resistant to the disease, they're just tolerant of them. Um, but that's a really good one to try. Now, if you, grapefruit and tangerines are the most susceptible of any of the citrus, and I wouldn't even recommend trying, trying, trying tangerines. Grapefruit, if you, if you really have to have grapefruit, Jackson grapefruit is the only one that's shown any kind of a tolerance. It's a white grapefruit, it's not red, and, and it's really not tolerant. Um, but if you feel like you have to have a grapefruit, you can try Jackson. And a lot of people have asked about lemons. Lemons are so vigorous that they can outgrow that, the, the greening. And so you can grow a lemon if you want. Lemons are very thorny, but you can try growing lemons if you want. A Meyer lemon is not a, a true lemon. It is a cross um, with an orange. And so it has some of that same susceptibility as other oranges, but it is still vigorous. And, and you can try growing um, a Meyer lemon as well. There's plenty of people still growing Meyer's lemons. All right. 
Now I will answer any kind of questions you have uh, about citrus or fruit, whatever. Um, if you want to chat, uh, type them in the chat room for, for Wanda to read out to me. Okay, um, I have one that says, I've had the leaf footed bugs on my tomato plants in a pot on one side of my yard and have a mature orange tree on the other side of my yard. What can I do to eliminate those bugs? <sighs> leaf footed bugs are just so hard to get rid of. Um, one of the things that we suggest, to, even for, for our growers, because I mean, insecticides. Um, but one of the things you can do if you don't like to spray too many insecticides, they love sunflowers. Leaf-footed bugs are attracted to sunflowers and we, we tell people to plant a sunflower trap crop so they're, they're attracted more to those sunflowers. They prefer sunflowers, so go to the sunflowers and then you can, you can spray the in sunflowers with insecticide but, uh, or, or just plant them to get the, them to go over there instead of onto your desired crops. But there's, I mean, it's insecticides or trying to do something like that. Um, they have some traps for, for um, stink bugs and all, but the, the, I mean, that just encourages them to come into it. So maybe plant some sunflowers in your neighbor's yard. <laughs> okay, um, next question. Are limes citrus tolerant? Are limes, uh, or, or limes are not tolerant to the citrus greening? And I didn't mention limes because limes are really not cold hardy here. If you have lime, it's probably a lime quat, which is a kumquat lime hybrid that make because kumquats are a little more cold tolerant. Um, so if you're growing limes, it, it's either because you haven't been growing them long enough to experience any cold weather here, or um, or you have a lime quat that's a little more cold hardy. But they are just as susceptible as any other citrus to uh, citrus. Okay. Um, does a citrus tree need another tree to bear fruit? No, it does not. In fact, there's a, there's a lot of um, seedless citrus, and they're seedless because they don't require any kind of cross pollination. Um, so navels, of course, you don't get seeds because they don't require cross pollination. Um, some other citrus can have a lot of seeds, and, and like um, the little cuties or the halos, things that you get. Um, they're seedless only if they're kept in, in a, a remote area where they don't get cross-pollination. Um, so if they try to keep the insects off of them as well. Some fruit can be bigger and better if it's po pollinated, but it's not required for most citrus. Okay, pomegranate, any issues with those? Pomegranates, um, we, Botrys furia is a fungal disease that gets into pomegranates, and we really don't have any control of that. So if you're going to try to grow pomegranates, um, keep it to a single trunk or four trunks at the most per plant. You try to keep it opened up and um, in air movement there so that you don't have too much fungal problems. But Botrysphyria is a, is a fungus problem that, that can kill the wood back and, it, and can get into the fruit and, and cause dieback and, and, and nasty looking black lesions in the fruit. But having said that, we have a, a pomegranate here at the Discovery Gardens that has been growing without any kind of care at all. And most of the fruit is okay. Some of the fruit is, is black and rotten, um, but not much of it. So um, it's still worth a try. But as I said, we, we don't have any real controls. They are working on breeding pomegranates Florida. Actually, the one that's most commonly bought in the grocery store is, the, is wonderful. It was bred in Florida, but California produces it all now because it's, it, it's not disease resistant. But they are, um, have just started on a breeding program to try to breed some that are more resistant to diseases here. I have a grapefruit and a lemon tree that I planted over a year ago and neither have grown. What can I do to promote growth? They probably both have, have greening, citrus greening, the grapefruit especially. Um, one of the things that you can do, because if, if they get greening when they're very small, they can stunt their growth and they may never grow. One of the things they're doing is they get these insect excluding bags and it's, it's a mesh that has to be fine enough to keep those insect, uh, the, the Asian citrus out and they will put the bag over the tree but you have to get that and, 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 and attach it at the bottom so that it keeps the insects out. 
you have to do that before there's ever any chance of a, of a psyllid getting in there. And so some people have put those on and then they've trapped psyllids in there and it just makes it worse. Um, so it's, it's not always that effective. Um, and then the other thing is that they will use um, a systemic insecticide like imidacloprid. It's a neonicotinoid, so it's not nice around bees, but that is a systemic insecticide that, can, that is used widely in nursery citrus and in young citrus for the first, mm, uh, uh, by the time it gets to be three years old, it's usually so big that uh, it, applying uh, an insecticide like that, uh, um, systemic, to the roots won't get out to the rest of the plants in sufficient quantities to keep the psyllids off. But you can use it for the first two years to kill the psyllids, something like imidacloprid, and that is something that you can get um, at, at a big box store. Um, so anything you can do to keep the psyllids off. Now, yours is already stunted. Um, you can try cutting it back and fertilizing heavily, um, but I would protect any new growth that you get, and, and you'll have to use that micronutrients as well as regular fertilizer. Um, protect any new growth you get with, with um, an insecticide probably, or an insect excluding bag to try to keep those insects off because as soon as they get the greening into it, and it may be that there's no, that you're not gonna be able to, to get it to come back. I've seen some trees that were so badly stunted that um, you're probably better off just get a new tree. What about like trees? Are they hardy to grow? What kind of trees? Like, L-I-K-E. They said, what about like trees? Um, I'm not sure what kind of tree that is. Me either. <laughs> how far? <laughs> how far? That might have been a typo. That might have been a typo, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. How far can trap plants be planted from your citrus and still help? Um. Uh, you know, I'm not really sure <laughs> how far away they can be. It's usually, you know, when we have a, a citrus grove, we put them in the, you know, the next uh, a row away or whatever, a, a, you know, a bed away. So it's, you know, 20 feet away. Um, so I, I, but I can't tell you for sure what the, what the optimum distance is, but I try to make it about 20 feet, if you can. A couple of people said thank you. Okay. All right, and then it says, oh, someone's asking when the next Master Gardener class is, and it probably won't be until next year, ma'am. Yes, okay, I missed, the, <laughs> I missed the first 30 minutes. Is there a recording of this lecture? And I, it looks like you have recorded it, Wanda? Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, how you post those to make them available to other people. It'll be on our, on our YouTube page. Okay. And the once, it's ready for, once it's ready for rages, once ready for for loading, it'll be up on our YouTube page. What's the YouTube page? Um, I think is Bay County Extension. Yeah, Lake UFI F Bay County Extension. Just look that up and it'll take them right to the page. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are avocado trees healthy in this area? Same issues oh. as citrus or not? Avocado trees are healthy except for the, the red bay laurel wilt. And red bay laurel wilt, the, um, it's a, a fungal disease. It's caused by an, a, a specific ambrosia beetle. The um, ambrosia beetles came through. The ambrosia beetle, it's a very interesting, it's, it's a symbiont. It carries um, fungal spores on it. When it bores into a tree, it introduces those fungal spores, the fungus grows, then it eats the, the fungus. So it actually is farming a fungus in its, in its um, galleries that it, that it bores. But it very quickly kills um, avocado trees. And um, several years ago, these, the, this wave of, the, it's an invasive in, new insect. Um, this wave came through, killed off all of the uh, red bays in our swampy areas and killed off most of the avocados. You can try growing an avocado, but there's no guarantee because these ambrosia beetles can come back. Um, we had a beautiful large avocado here in the Discovery Gardens, and it was dead in two weeks from that um, red bay laurel wilt. They usually are not attracted to wood that's less than an inch in diameter. And so the small avocado trees will get a start. And just as you're starting to get some, some production, the ambrosia beetles move in and kill it. Um, 
if you can grow it in an area where and ambrosia beetles are pretty small, they're like an eighth of an inch long. Um, so I don't know about excluding screens uh, or growing into your screen enclosure, but um, that's the only real problem that we have with avocados, other than making sure that you get a cold hardy one. How old do they need to be to fruit? Avocados? If you have a grafted avocado, it can start producing fruit within um, three to five years. If you are growing the avocado from a seed, it can take 10 to 13. Okay. Thank you for a very informative seminar. Okay, lichen maybe. That's what somebody asked, I don't know. Which, um, I wish I could see these chats. Let me see here, maybe I can. Okay. Um, lichen, somebody, lichen? Um, L-I-C-H-E-N maybe. Yeah, L-I-C-H-E-N is a lichen. That is a, a symbiont um, fungal algae. Mm -hmm. they, trees, they don't hurt anything. Um, okay. uh, any of the diseases linger in the soil? Um, uh, no, none of these will, will cause a problem in the soil. Um, so you can, you can, uh, don't have to treat the soil. If you have Phytophthora, you'll want to make sure that you get a, a tree that has, the, uh, or a rootstock that is resistant or tolerant to Phytophthora. And, and there are some other ones. Swingle is the most common one that's used that is resistant to Phytophthora. Um, you can look at the, there's a rootstock guide. So if you do rootstocks, IFAS, um, you can come up with a guide that will tell you all the list of, of rootstocks and their tolerances to different things, including Phytophthora. Um, I, but, um, the, the biggest thing for homeowners is getting a tree and finding out what the rootstock is, because they often don't tell you. If you get that nursery tag, though, that nursery tag should tell you what that rootstock is. It'll have the, the cyan cultivar and the slash and then the, the rootstock cultivar, and you should be able to see what you have. How long does it take a pomegranate to produce? Um, once again, about uh, probably two or three years. Um, it just depends on how much growth you get. Uh, might have been lime. I'm not sure. Um, my avocado tree. I think tree. they were talking about the like tree. When somebody said the like tree, maybe they were talking about okay, lime. lime. Maybe they okay, were uh, lime. Okay, yeah, lime. I, you know, we don't really work with limes because they're not cold hardy up here. If you have a lime quat, um, produce small limes, but um, they are susceptible to greening. Um, Avocado trees have dropped their flowers. Any idea why? I do not know. It could be something with um, irrigation, too much and then too little. It may just be that the, the flowers didn't get pollinated. Um, yeah. Okay, someone says their lime tree does not flower. What can, they, what can be done? Lime tree does not flower. Um, how old is it? <laughs> um, and 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 citrus citrus grow by they have a flush of growth, and that flush of growth in the spring will have flowers on it. Um, if you're not getting a good flush of growth in the spring, you might not get any flowers just because you're not having a good flush of growth. Um, and then and things like uh, limes actually will have a flush of growth and flowers I think year round. Um, so. If, it may be just that your your tree is just not growing. It's not um, hardy enough. It's not not producing enough um, growth to have flowers. Um, best way to identify exactly what kind of orange citrus it is. That's going to be difficult. Um, the easy ones are navels, because you can see. Um, but um, how to tell um, uh, an, an an old orange tree in your yard? Um, you can try bringing some into the plant clinic here, but it's, it, it is difficult to tell because it could be um, just a, a wild, wild citrus are usually the sour oranges and they're growing in, in the forest all over the place. Um, but it, it really will be based on the shape of the fruit and the taste of the fruit and, and when it ripens. Um, at least four years old. Oh, okay, so this is the the lime tree was at least four years old, but does it have good growth? Are you getting, um, say, 10 inches of new growth every year on that um, tree? 
Any tips for pruning large mature citrus tree, orange tree? Okay, orange trees, um, commercially, they just come through and they'll use a hedger to keep them in their space. They are not really very particular about how, how you prune an orange tree. It's not like pruning an apple tree or something like that. So orange trees, you can prune them back to whatever space you want them to fill. You can prune out dead and diseased branches or prune back nasty looking little things. Um, but you can, I mean, you can even prune citrus trees way back to, you know, dehorn them. And they're, they're just like hat racks almost. And, and they will regrow from that, but they don't produce fruit for a while then because they're concentrating on, on getting more growth back. So uh, for, for pruning a large mature citrus, Prune it back as hard as you want. Just expect that if you prune it back really hard, it'll take a few years before it comes back into production. But there's no, no rules about in citrus. Um, okay, avocado. They have a big many, avocado. Fruit, many fruits drop, many fruits dropping before fully maturing for the last month. Um, that sounds like it might be an irrigation issue um, that if a tree is just not growing that well, it may just drop its fruit. Um, I, I don't think it has, I don't think there's any kind of disease that would cause fruit to drop. It's, it's whether it gets pollinated um, and, and um, you know, maybe it didn't get pollinated because that's a problem with avocados. They do have to be pollinated. And um, if they don't get pollinated, they'll, they'll they drop them. Um, what about pruning out of control avocado? Out of control avocado can also be pruned back very hard. They prune those way back down south and you know, let it re regrow. Again, you may lose the, some yield because of that, but prune it back, doesn't hurt. Um, you do have another one nearby, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work as a cross pollinator. Um, the avocados have, it's a kind of a complicated, you know, when the, when the, the, the um, anthesis is occurring, when the, when, the, when the pollen is released and when the, when the female fruit are actually um, receptive, um, there's an interesting, um, an interesting um, publication, the University of Florida, if you type in I, uh, avocado and ifis, um, you'll come up with some information about that pollination issues with avocado and, and um, what can be done about it? Because sometimes the same, it may be something to do with the cultivar. Some cultivars can pretty much pollinate themselves, but other ones don't. Um, what strength fertilizer should be used? You know, most homeowners start with a, you know, an 888 or an 828 if you can. Um, that's um, pretty much a, a recommended um, strength of fertilizer to use for any kind of fruit trees, because you don't want to, you don't want to, the fertilizers for turf are usually really high nitrogen, really get the turf growing. That's not what you really want to use on your garden or on your fruit trees. So uh, something like an 828. Um, what we recommend for palm trees is 8-2-12-4, uh, which is the magnesium. Um, that would also be really good for your fruit trees or, or anywhere in your landscape or your garden. Okay, that looks no more questions? That's it. All right. Okay. All right, look like everyone's leaving, so. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all, and, and we will have another program. Oops, I got two more. We will have a, um, another program next Friday at 2 o'clock. I'm not sure what is the next topic, Wanda. It's, um... Oh my God, I just forgot, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> it's cultivating and uh, cooking with herbs. All right, great. We'll see you next week. Take care and stay well. Okay. You ended up with 47 people. 47, all right. A couple of people got kicked out. Their internet was acting up, so. I'll let you stop me. the recording and. Yeah, I guess we better stop it.